The thing that people will do sometimes are people that are talking to you about an IUL policy, they'll tell you, they'll say, well, okay, um, of course, the IUL is going to be tied, okay, to the stock market. So if the stock market does great, the IUL may perform better. If it does bad, you know, it's not going to do as well. And the thing you always hear people say is over the last X amount of years, I've made an average rate of return in the stock market or right or or that's the stock market talk. Um, I'm making an average rate of return. Well, if uh, you read the book that Chris and I wrote mapping out the millionaire mystery, there's a page in there and I don't have a copy with me because I'm at like another house here right now. And I don't have one here with me, but uh, I can't remember the page where it says actual rate of return versus average rate of return. Well, that's a big, huge difference. The thing that I do is I go in and compare what an actual rate of return is and what an average rate of return is. And the example is that I use is a person starts with a hundred dollars at the beginning of year one. And that hundred dollars goes up to $200 in that year. So they made a hundred percent return that year because it went from a hundred to two hundred. So they made a hundred percent return. But now we go from year, from the beginning of year two till the end of year two, and that two hundred goes down to one hundred. So the thing that happened there is we lost fifty percent. So now we go to year three, and that one hundred now goes to two hundred. So we got a hundred percent gain that year. Are you with me? So the first year we gained 100%. The second year we lost 50%. And the third year we gained 100%. And then finally in year four, what happens is that $200 now goes back to $100. So we lost 50% that year. So we had two years, year one and three, where we gained 100% that year. And then we have two years, year two and four, where we lost 50%. Okay? Now, so the important thing is here is how much did we start with at the beginning of year one? $100. How much did we end with at the end of year four? $100. But if you add all of those numbers up, all right, just over those four years, you actually made an average, an average rate of return of 25%. So if I would have asked you guys, and I probably, okay, so anyway, like before I just asked this question or explain this scenario, the thing I should have asked you is I should have said, hey, how about if I can guarantee you without a doubt a 25% average rate of return over the next four years? You guys would be knocking on down the door, blowing up the cell phone. Yeah, yeah, man, I want some of that. I want some of that 25% average rate of return. Well, that's exactly what I just gave you was a 25% average rate of return over those four years. But how much did you start with at the beginning of year one? $100. How much did you end with at the end of year four? hundred dollars. So your actual rate of return is zero, is zero. And guess how valuable those dollars were compared to the day four years ago? Because remember, you started with a hundred dollars, okay, just four years ago at the first month. And here you are at the end of the fourth year, month 48, four years later, and you have the same hundred dollars. Well, that $100 was worth way more than it is today, four years ago. Because as time goes on, a dollar, right, it's going to get weaker. So a dollar is always worth more today than it is in the future. And if you ever forget that, think about how many candy bars you could buy 25 years ago for a dollar and how many you could buy today. And especially in the world that we're living in right now, where inflation is just out the roof. I don't know what in the hell is going to happen, but right. I mean, we're, I mean, it's things are inflated, but again, the whole point of that is when somebody talks to you about, but I can get an average rate of return. I can get an average rate of return. It doesn't matter what the average is. It only matters what the actual is. It, it only matters when you get in and when you get out, go look at the history of the stock market. You'll see a lot of those years are totally in red, which means it went down. You lost the money. So you can't go by average rate of return. And that's what they tell you in the IUL world. It means nothing. 
The only thing that matters is what you start with and what you get out with your actual rate of return. Couldn't agree more. Such a good example too. And I tell people that all the time, kind of the same example. Let's say you start with a hundred bucks, you make a 50% return. So now you're up to 150 bucks, right? Next year you lose 50%. Your average is a 0% return, right? But if you lose 50% of 150, that's 75. You actually have less the next year, That's right. but you got a 0% return on average, right? Yeah. So that's huge. And another thing that really I love about um, whole life policies is how we build them. We build them for instant liquidity. Um, some as high as 85, 90% immediately within the first 30 days, right? So the policies that I have that are IULs, I put in, let's see, I've got two of them. It totals $18,000 a year. I don't have any access until year four, which I think at year four, I have access to like nine grand. So I've put in over four years, 40, whatever that would be. Um, my math's horrible right now, but it's over like 60 grand, right? and I have access to nine, that doesn't make any sense, right? With the same kind of whole life policy I structure and we structure, you could have access to more than you put in by that time. And the spread just keeps growing because the biggest thing, guys, the biggest thing, I can't stress this enough, is the guarantees on fees and costs and compound interest. You're always going to make 4% guaranteed as long as the policy is funded by, before the end of this year, Next year, they're lower in the guarantee, probably around 3% or so. You're always going to make the guarantee plus dividends. So dividends payout right now, I think is about 2%. We're in a low rate market. As rates go up, if they do, guess what's going to happen to dividends? They're going to go up as well. These policies back in the 80s, when interest rates were through the roof, were paying like 13, 14% dividend. So that's the power is you have the guarantees, Plus you participate in the profit of the company and it never gets more expensive. It stays the same. So we always compare it to like an airplane. When you're flying an airplane and you have a headwind, the plane goes slower. It has to work harder. If you put a tailwind on a plane, it goes faster with less effort. It's the same thing with a policy. As you get more money into a policy, as it keeps growing and the fees and costs never go up, the plane or the policy gets more efficient. It just grows faster and faster and faster, and it never stops. It is exponential growth for the rest of your life, guaranteed. And that's not worth, that, that's just the policies, guys. The policy is not a silver bullet. You're not going to get a policy and just become a multimillionaire overnight. It will not happen. If you get a policy and you use it to go multiply your money, that's the power of it. You put money in, you have instant access, put money in. It's going to grow compounding for the rest of your life. You then use it at the exact same time that it's compounding to go make more money. You're making money in multiple places at the same time. I can't do that with my IULs. I can do it with the whole life policies. Yeah, um, no, great point, Devin. You touched on a lot of um, like different things there, and I know we'll kind of get into it a little bit more. But um, so in the policy, the most important thing is it is guaranteed, like Devin said. I mean, it doesn't matter um, if, right? So like there's two sides of the illustration. There's the guaranteed side and the non-guaranteed side. And no matter what side you look at, you see an increase in both. The only difference between guaranteed and non-guaranteed is the projected amount there, the insurance company will pay that year in dividends. And once the dividend is declared, it can never be retracted. Every company that we write business with has been paying dividends for over 120 consecutive years without fail. So even though they're not guaranteed, right? It, 120 plus years. So again, so is there a pretty good chance they're going to pay a dividend this year, next year, 10 years, 20 years from now? Absolutely. But even if they don't, 
You just look at the guaranteed side of the illustration. There's kind of a joke that we have in the industry whenever we're doing these whole life policies is the thing I tell people is to look at the guaranteed side of your illustration. And really the thing that that word means is it's guaranteed to never be that number that you see there. All right. Because it's going to be a number higher than that because of the dividend. Right. And again, all the companies we work with, 120 plus consecutive years without fail, they pay dividends. But even if they don't, then the worst case scenario is that guaranteed side part of the policy. Now, the one thing Devin touched on is he said, hey, you know, these policies are structured and, and to have a 4% guarantee. And what you need to do is start your policy before the end of this year because of this thing they call a Rule 77. I'm not going to get into 7702. You can look it up or ask, um, okay, so whoever you're talking to about it. But basically what it says is that all the insurance companies, they have to restructure their products because, again, we've been in such a low interest rate environment for a long time. They can no longer keep that 4% uh, guarantee in the policy. So they're lowering that. We got one company I just talked to yesterday. They're going to be at 3%. Another one I know is at 3.25%. And, and again, probably a lot of you are thinking, oh man, that sucks. You know, it's going to go down. It's going to get worse. Well, no, don't look at it that way at all because all the companies, as I mentioned, have been paying dividends for over a hundred plus years. So I don't think you're going to see an effect in what's going to happen. The guaranteed side is going to go down, but these companies are going to be profitable and, and then it just increases their dividend is what happens. So it's going to be made up on that end. Now, also, there's a couple other points to, to it that we really haven't talked about is um, so, OK, so when they change. The thing that's going to happen is it allows for a higher, what we call a MEC limit, MEC, Modified Endowment Contract. And if you don't know what that is, and if you have the book that I promote all the time, Becoming Your Own Banker by R. Nelson Nash, he talks about that on page 38 of the book. All right. So it's called the MEC limit. So really what the MEC limit is, is it says, OK, we can put... X amount of cash into this policy, but we cannot go over the MEC limit because if we try to overfill it, then the policy becomes a MEC. And if it becomes a MEC, it's no longer treated as an insurance contract and it's subject to taxation. So we don't want to do that. So when we design your policy, we snuggle it right up to the MEC line. Now, all right, but with this change, it's going to allow that MEC limit to increase. So a lot of you people that want to stuff more and more money into the policy and what we call the paid up additions portion, you're now going to be able to do that, right? So, and again, I know we deal with a lot of real estate investors. You know, we have a huge clientele of real estate investors. You guys really like that because you want to stuff more money into the policy and you want to have that immediate access as Devin was talking about. And the immediate access is within 30 Day. So that is going to go up. They're raising the ceiling a little bit, okay, on that. So that's going to be a good thing. The other cool thing about it is your loan interest rate is going to be is going to decrease. So right now, all the companies that we use, we're basically at 5% for loan interest. Again, I don't have any company that charges us more than 5% for loan interest. They're going to, all right, so that is going to decrease. I know one company, uh, I can't remember if they're going to go down to its, um, man, I should have wrote this down and I have it written somewhere. It's either going to be lowered to 4.25 or 4.5%, the loan interest rate. So that means it's going to cost less to borrow the money, right? So that is going to go down. So I really don't look at this as a bad thing at all. Um, it's just that it's change, man. And people usually don't like change, right? They don't like it when you move the cheese. The, the, so the thing is, we got the cheese moved a little bit. If, if uh, we were having this conversation back in the 1980s, the guaranteed growth rate on policies were five and a half percent back in the 70s or 80s, right? But most of you don't even know that. 
You don't even know that. You've just always known it to be it, at the guaranteed level of 4%. But you got to remember what was happening in the 70s and the 80s. We were paying 18, 21% to borrow money to buy a house, right? How much are we paying now to buy a house? Three, 4%. So time has changed a little bit. And, and again, it all is going to work the same way. It's all going to work the same way. So don't get hung up on the guaranteed growth rate. A lot of people get hung up on that. The most important thing that you can do with that policy is when you put money in, and again, like Nelson says on page 48 of his book, premium and income should actually equal. Eventually, you want income to equal premium. That means, what, what does that mean? That means if you are have a job or whatever you do for your career, let's just say you make 100,000 a year, Eventually, you want your premium to be 100000 a year. Premium and income should equal. Go review page 48 of Nelson's book, um, okay? And, and so it basically, he talks about that. Now, most people can never get there to premium equaling income because the insurance company won't allow you to have that much death benefit coverage because you can't overinsure a body the same way you can't overinsure a house or a car. So, Again, don't get wrapped up on that 4% guarantee because remember, all right, remember, all your policies have a policy illustration associated with it, right? Every policy you guys have, you have a policy illustration. That illustration, all that shows you is it shows you the raw version of the policy and it assumes that what you're going to do is you're going to buy that policy and you're going to put the policy on your shelf and never do anything with it. You're never going to borrow money for it. You're not going to use it for the infinite banking concept. The more you use the policy for the things that you're buying in life anyway, products, services, debts, expenses, investments, whatever it is you're buying, those numbers just keep getting bigger. As long as you're playing honest banker with yourself and treating your money exactly like you would treat a bank's money. So really in real life, the numbers are way bigger than the illustration. And if you don't believe it, Again, go to that book, Nelson Nash, Becoming Your Own Banker. Look at page 54, 59, page 60, 61, and 62. That's the same person on all of those pages. As those pages go up, the numbers get bigger. The cash value gets bigger. The retirement income gets bigger. And the death benefit gets bigger. And all he's doing is he's using the policy to buy the trucks that he has to buy anyway for his trucking business. So all you're doing is you're going to buy the houses you're going to buy for your real estate business. You're going to buy the boats that you have for your boating business. Whatever it is that you're buying, you're going to run the money through the policy and those numbers are going to skyrocket. So that's why every year, and hopefully all you guys are working with your mapping team at least two to three times a year and you're updating your money multiplier map. And also once a year, if this isn't being done, you need to ask your mapping person to get you your in-force illustration. Every year, get your in-force illustration because now you can take that illustration and compare it to your original one that you got and you can see, okay, how did my policy perform compared to the original illustration? Did it perform better than expected or less than expected? So every year, get that in-force illustration, right? It's kind of like changing your the batteries in your smoke alarm, right? You're supposed to do that twice a year when the clocks change. It's just something you're supposed to do. Most of you guys don't do it, you know, and I'm one of you because I'm the guy that at three o'clock in the morning, it starts beeping and you got 16 of these around the house. And you don't know where the hell it's coming from. <laughs> so now you're up on a step ladder in the middle of the night and your boxers trying to change it and find which smoke alarm you got to change, right? How is that a good visual? Me changing the smoke alarm in the boxers in the middle of the night? <laughs> I want to delete that image from my mind. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, looks like some of you guys are asking questions in the Q&A. Thank you for doing that because we were getting in the chat just too much stuff to follow. So if you have questions, throw them in the Q&A. Um, we're going to be busy answering them. So I'm going to try to get to them. Uh, Brent will try. We've got Hannah on here. She'll be uh, answering some and Shauna as well. Um, one of them I'll get to right now, actually, it says, why not just do one of each for their respective benefits? I'm um, talking about the whole life in the IUL. And that's from Andrew Lee. So Andrew, great question. That's essentially what I'm doing. I have two IULs for retirement. In my opinion, IULs should be used 
for retirement. They should not be used for infinite banking. So with retirement, you think of any retirement fund, retirement account, you've got risk, right? So 401ks, um, IRAs, things like that. If the market tanks, so does your money. So with an IUL, if you're putting money in it, there's a, the potential that it's going to grow to be a lot of money. If you don't have a bunch of market dips, if your cost of insurance doesn't go through the roof, you could have a really good retirement. So that's what I did my IULs for. I put them there, set them and forget them, just like you do with a 401k or whatever. With a whole life policy structured for infinite banking, you're not setting it and forgetting it. You could, it wouldn't be the best use of it. If you just put money in it, it's going to grow far faster than any other bank account you know, savings, checking accounts, they're not going to grow like a whole life policy will, but you're not getting the most out of the policy. If that's all you do, you should put the money in and then find an investment for it to go into. I like to look at it as like, like a warehouse for your money. You're storing your money. You're not saving it. Saving doesn't make any sense. You're storing it at the same time that you're storing it. It's always going to grow. And then once an opportunity comes up, you've got this storage of capital that you can access and leverage. So then you leverage that capital to go do an investment. You make a 50% return, a 30% return, a 500% return, whatever, outside of the policy while your stored money is continuing to grow tax-free. So you're basically just controlling the money. You're controlling what you do with it. You can take a policy loan and you can pay it back. You don't have to. There's no you know, insurance provider that's going to say, Devin, on this day, you have to pay this amount back to your policy, or we're going to give you a late payment. It's going to affect your credit. It's not like that. You're just leveraging your future death benefit. So if you never pay back any policy loans, what happens is your death benefit goes down by the amount you did not pay back. That's in your control. You can pay it back and get the death benefit right back to the full amount for your beneficiaries. You are in control. Um, you cannot pay it back, have that money just go into different investments, which is what I do. Let's say I take a hundred grand out of a policy. Um, I'm using big numbers because I have big policies. So I apologize guys, but if I take a hundred grand out of a policy and I go do a real estate deal with it, I make a 50% return. Very low for me, but just to keep math easy, I would get back 150 grand. Instead of paying back the policy loan of 100, what I do is I take the 100 and put it into another investment. Have it keep moving, have it keep growing. The 50 that I got, I either start another policy or I take the full 150 and put it into another investment. I get the money back on that. Instead of paying back the policy loan, I just go do another investment keep the money moving, keep the money growing the whole time. Everything you put into a policy never loses its opportunity cost. Think about this. I've got this money here, right? This money, if I go spend it, it's gone. It'll never make me money ever again. But if I first put this money into a policy, this money is guaranteed to grow for the rest of my life then I can use it to go grow it elsewhere. It's, it's opportunity cost never gets lost. If you just spend money, that money's gone. It'll never make you money again. So bottom line is guys, I use policies for a lot of different things. Investing, I don't have any debt, so I don't gotta worry about that, but investing, um, retirement, and in my opinion, my honest opinion from doing this every day, and having both policies, an IUL should be set up for retirement. It should not be used for infinite banking. You can get in a lot of trouble if the market goes down, your cash value goes down, costs go up. It can be a mess. So hopefully that answers your question for you. Um, anyway, I'll just add to that. I own zero IULs. Um, I don't, I, I just don't. Uh, and, and again, if if I'll let you really want an IUL, yes, I could sell you an IUL, but I would never sell you one because I would never buy one. OK, now. Right. So does that mean they're bad? Um, it, it depends. You know, like Devin said, he has them. I don't I don't have any and I'll never buy one. Um, 
because I want the guaranteed side. And of course, I've been doing this a long time and I talk to a lot of people. You know, I do eight or 10 calls a day, three, four, sometimes five days a week. And I've seen the people that are taking the bloodbath in their IULs. And I just, I, I see it every single week because if you go look at the guaranteed side of any IUL policy, and I don't know if Devin's going to share one today with us or not, but but again, even if he doesn't, we have them, I think, online. I think Chris and I just did a comparison with Whole Life and IUL. There's a big, long video out there as well. But if you go look at the guaranteed side of any IUL policy, I want you to look and see what happens when you get to a certain age, usually in your mid-50s or at least by your early 60s right? The numbers decrease in value. The cash decreases and the death benefit decreases, and it can go all the way down to zero. And I've talked to a lot of those people, and that's exactly what's happening because the cost of insurance cannot keep up with the IUL. So if a person really wants an IUL, here's what I tell them. I say, go buy a whole life policy, right? And then invest into an IUL policy. Take a loan from your whole life and now go buy a, um, a IUL policy. It's the same thing if you buy a piece of real estate. Put the money in the whole life policy, then invest in the real estate, right? Because an IUL is an investment. A whole life policy is not an investment because the true definition of an investment, even though the majority of people think a whole life policy is an investment, because it goes up in value, but a true, okay, the truth, um, uh, all right, like an investment, what is an investment? What's the true definition of an investment? Something that can go up and something that can go down. So the whole life policy is not an investment because it can never go down. IUL can go up or down. So now I said I would never buy a whole life, or, or, or uh, okay, so I said I would never buy an IUL policy. But I also don't have any money in the stock market either. Zero. I don't put any money in the stock market. And essentially, if I'm buying an IUL, that's kind of what I'm doing, right? I'm kind of putting money in the market or I'm relying on the market for the returns. Now, so does that mean stocks are bad? No. I just, I, I just don't want to turn on the TV or the computer and all of a sudden things tank or, you know, do this or do that. I just, I just don't want that. I want to take my money and I want to put it into good, solid investments, which is a lot of this, what you guys do into real estate, or I might do hard money loan. I might do, you know, some, um, right. Hard money loans or note investing, or I loan other people money, but I have the collateral. I don't loan money on just them signing it and saying, I promise to pay you back because the signature means nothing. I want the collateral of that asset. So if they don't pay the loan back, then it's going to be tied to something. They're going to lose something. And usually it's tied to something like real estate, right? So I know if they're not making the payments, I'm going to do exactly what the bank would do on you. And I'm going to foreclose and I'm going to own the property that I just loaned you the money on. And there's enough spread there to where I'm not going to be in trouble because I didn't loan you a hundred percent of value. And those deals are out there all day long. I mean, it's all day long. So go to the private money club with Stephen Nagy and Chris Noggle and look at all the deals that are out there. So that's a good place to find those. So I don't want to go to bed at night and kind of thinking, oh my, I might lose in, okay, so in the stock market or in the IUL or something like that, because the guaranteed value goes down. Just, all right, that's just me. That's not the way that I want to live my life. It doesn't mean it's not right for you, but there's so many things that are out there where we can have guaranteed returns and guaranteed growth. So if you really, really want an IUL, I suggest put the money in the whole life policy and now go make the investment into it. But again, that's just me. Um, and then again, the cost of insurance. So on the guaranteed side of any IUL, and, and okay, so if you're thinking of buying an IUL policy and you're talking to somebody and says, well, let's, okay, um, all right, let's buy the IUL policy. We'll use it for banking. Just like Devin says, you can get in a lot of trouble when those things start going down. And also, I would suggest that whoever is talking to you about the IUL, the thing you got to do is make sure they show you before you pay for that policy, 
make sure they show you the illustration because on the guaranteed side, you'll see those things can go down to zero. But most of the time, the agents won't even show you that page. They'll leave that out because they don't want to talk about it. They don't want to explain it. And again, guys, I've been doing this for a long time, and I talk to people every day that have taken a bloodbath in those things. So um, anyway, that's just kind of my take on the whole IUL. I wouldn't buy one, um, so I would never I, – I, I would – so, so – Okay, so even if you come to me and I can I can make a nice commission if you buy an IUL policy, a very nice commission, but I'm not going to do it. I, I will never sell you one because I wouldn't buy one myself. Yeah, it's correct. I mean, it's it's the difference between being an investment and not, right? Like an IUL is an investment. It can lose money. Um, a whole life policy can't lose money. So by definition, it's not an investment. It's literally, again, I go back to this. It's a it's a warehouse for your money. It's a storage vehicle. It's a savings vehicle. Um, and it gives you the ability to use your future death benefit now. So you have access to that money while you're alive. Um, and it's all tax free. So a couple of questions here I was reading through, I think are really good. This one's from Blaine. Um, he says, I know I've asked this before. Section 162 of the IRS code makes life insurance tax deductible for businesses. It can act as an employee retention slash retirement strategy for small businesses who are lacking strategic tax deductions or lacking IRS authorized deductions through the business, why wouldn't infinite banking be a perfect vehicle for this? Amazing question. And to answer you, Blaine, it is a great vehicle for it. If, if the policy is individually owned, you can get an individually owned policy or a corporate owned policy. Individually owned means that you as the individual, you own it. Corporate it means that the corporation owns it. Very simple. Individually owned, when you take a policy loan, the money goes from your policy and it has to go to a bank account in your name. So the name on the policy has to match the name of the bank account. Very important. So it goes from the policy to your personal bank account. Now you can lend money to your business. So when you lend money, you can charge an interest rate, right? So what I do with my policies is I take a policy loan, it goes to my personal bank account. I then write a check from my personal bank account to my business bank account. And I just put in the memo line, loan for working capital, whatever it's for, right? I charge my business 15% interest. And it's believable if I ever get audited because I used to pay 18% to hard money lenders. So I'm lending at a lower percentage than I used to pay, right? So I lend to my company at 15%. I create a note. So that way, if I ever get audited, I have a paper trail. It's all legit. Now I have 15% that I can write off as a tax deduction every year going back into my policy. So if I take out hundred grand, that's $15,000 a year. I get back going into my policy that I can use instantly. I put money in the policy. I can instantly use it again. I do not pay back the principal. Remember I said that earlier, guys, the hundred grand I take out, I just keep it moving into new investments. I just keep putting the interest that I'm charging my company back in. That interest is a tax write-off. So I pay less taxes on my business and the interest charged from the insurance company is 5% right now. So at the end of the year, what I do is I write a check directly from my business bank account to the insurance company for what's owed in interest. That's another tax deduction. So there's a lot of ways you can do it, guys. We're not going to get too much in the weeds because you can buy cars as a company vehicle. You can lease the car to your business. I just bought my mom a car as a company vehicle because she cleans my Airbnbs. Mm -hmm. I write that off. There's so many ways you can do it just by simply putting your money into this savings vehicle first. That's it. So Blaine, hopefully that answers that question for you, man. Yeah, so Devin, good stuff. And just to clarify the disclaimer is this is what Devin does in his own life, right? So consult with your tax professional to see what's deductible or not deductible. But Devin is telling you what he is doing um, and, and all of what he said, I agree with. But again, it depends on if you're using the money for the business. Also, a trust can own a policy as well. I usually don't recommend the policy is owned by the corporation or the S Corp or the LLC, because remember, these policies are appreciating assets. And um, 
in the majority of the states, they're protected against lawsuits and judgments when you own them individually or your trust owns them. But if the corporation owns them, and let's say the corporation got sued for some reason and there was a judgment against the corporation, that could be an asset that's tied to the judgment. So I don't like corporations to own the policy, exactly like what, what you heard from Devin. I own the policies. And then if you remember, I own several chiropractic clinics at one time. I would loan my chiropractic clinics money and the chiropractic clinics would have to pay me back with interest. And if I ever got sued or there was a judgment um, against my chiropractic clinic, well, um, again, so the policy is not owned by them. As a matter of fact, they have a, a debt, don't they? The chiropractic clinic has a debt because they owe somebody a loan and that loan has to be paid off before that debt can be collected or it's got to be part of that, right? So lots of different ways to protect you there. But also keep in mind the most important thing I think here is even if you had no tax deductions whatsoever, even if there was no tax advantages. And I tell people all the time, do not do a whole life policy just solely for the benefits of taxes. It can only put you in a better position. It cannot make the position any worse. But I don't think the benefits that you get tax wise are worth just doing a policy for that sole purpose alone. So if that's your mission um, and that's your only mission, that's probably not a strong enough reason for you to start the policy. What's most important, I think, is if you take that money, right? The thing we're doing is any money we put into a policy, we're putting in that with after tax dollars, which means we pay tax on that money one time. And that's what we wanna do. The thing we want to do is pay tax on our money one time, one time only at the lowest tax rate possible. And we want to get that money into a tax-free environment where it's growing tax-free and we want the government completely out of our hair. So that's exactly what we want. And now, anytime you take a loan from the policy, well, that's not going to be a taxable event, is it? Because you've never paid tax on a loan. As a matter of fact, like Devin says, you have an interest deduction if it's going for a business purpose and your CPA says that, yes, you can deduct that because it's going for a business purpose. And if your CPA tells you, no, you can't do that, and, you're, and, the, and the thing is, you are, you, are, you are doing it for a business purpose, then my opinion, just, again, this is just my opinion, you may want to start looking for another CPA, maybe call Devin's and see what's going on there, right? So again, there's a lot of this stuff we have to educate the CPAs on because they don't know because they're in the standard, you know, as far as everyday world. Now, I don't want to get off topic here, but also there's another type of tax structure. It's called the 1041 tax structure. Most all of you guys file a form 1040. I would suggest you look into a 1041 tax structure if your tax liability is above 70 five thousand dollars a year which means if you pay state federal local taxes of more than seventy five thousand a year i would definitely look into the 1041 tax structure if you're not paying 75 grand a year in taxes then it may not be the way to go yet but always keep it on the back burner because one day you will be paying that kind of money because your income and your wealth will will continue to go up. The last point I wanted to make is, and again, I just wanted to clarify what Devin said. Remember, anytime that the person dies, there's the death benefit associated with the policy. All right. So, so all of the death benefit gets paid out. All right. So the death benefit never goes down. It, it Okay, that full death benefit is going to get paid out. What's going to happen is any loan that you have on the policy, the death benefit will pay off that policy loan because they've already given you that money while you're living. And the additional money that they haven't given you yet will go to your beneficiaries tax-free. So the death benefit doesn't go down. It's just it's going to pay off any outstanding policy loan that you have. So I, um, anyway, I, I just wanted to clarify that point, but, but yeah, man, good stuff. What's next, Devin. Oh, um, good questions here, guys. While Brent was chatting, I was trying to go through and answer as many as I could. Um, but I think now it might be a good time to share some of my illustrations. What do you guys no, think? You guys great. want to see actual illustrations, things of 
These are my policies, illustrations of them so you guys can see the real numbers and we can kind of get into the weeds, so to speak, on how these things work. Um, let me see if I can figure out, I'm like the worst at technology guys, so bear with me. Uh, share screen, seems like that would be it, right? Share. All right, so let me know if you guys see my illustration. You see it on here, Brent? All right, cool. So sorry, I'm muted. Yes, I got it. No worries. All right. So this is some of my policies here. So this one, again, I have decent sized policies, guys. So this, some of them are smaller. So I'll show those as well. A lot of people might get like overwhelmed, like, oh, I can't put in that much into a policy and totally understandable. But just to show you this one, since it's the first one up here, I can put in for the first 10 years, $125,000. That's the max that I can put in. If I put in more, I run the risk of it becoming a mech. Um, if it's a mech, the rest of your life, the um, policy is treated like a taxable vehicle. It's no longer an insurance policy. So we set the limit for you guys based on what you say you want to be able to put in. For me, this policy, I said I can put in 125 grand a year. Um, as I made more money and I had more to put in, I can't put more into this policy. So all I do is I just start a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth. So that's why you have more policies so you can get more money compounding. Regardless, 125,000 goes in per year for the first 10 years. After that, the max I can put in is 50, okay? Can't put in more than 50,000 bucks after year 10. So you guys will see guaranteed values, um, guaranteed increase, and then um, you'll see here the death benefit. This isn't even showing with dividends, but just guarantees you'll see that I have access to immediately $115,000 of the 125. So I can go take this 115 and make more money. If you look at this, a lot of people would say, oh, but you're losing 10,000 bucks. I can tell you right now, and anybody on this call can do the same. If you know what to do, you can make a heck of a lot more than 10,000 bucks with 115. Guaranteed. If you know what you're doing, you can make a lot more. So I technically lose 10 grand because I don't have access to all my money immediately, but I can go take this and make a heck of a lot more than 10, all right? Now, if we look at with dividends, which is more accurate because these companies have paid dividends every single year through the Great Depression, through World War I, World War II, the Great Recession, um, they've paid a dividend when the country was literally on collapse several times. These companies have been strong and profitable. So to say that you're gonna get the guarantees is probably not gonna happen. You're gonna get some dividends most likely. So if we look at this, 10 years, I can put in 125. So I've put in uh, 1.25 million, right? Uh, let's see, I gotta move this because here we go. All right, so I've put that amount in and I have access to 1.4. Okay, so I can actually use that money. It's going to keep growing. So as you see, the cash value just keeps going up. As the cash value goes up, so does the death benefit. So let's say uh, this would be year 24, however old I'd be at that point. I've got 3.1 million in this one policy. Let's say I use all of it. I take it all out and I go do investments with it. I don't pay back a penny of that principal. What's going to happen when I pass away is... My wife, who's the beneficiary with the difference between this death benefit and the cash value. So she's still going to get a good amount of money, 6 million bucks in this one policy tax free. She's also going to get everything I used or everything I bought with the money. I buy real estate. So she's going to get all the properties. She's also going to get $6 million tax free income. So that's kind of to show you guys real quick, that one policy. Let's look at an IUL real quick. So this is one of my IULs, $12,000 a year. Oh, now you guys are seeing my emails. Now you guys are seeing my notes and my car. Where did that go? Oh, that's not it. Did I say I was bad at technology or what? Hey, so anyway, just as he's pulling that up and, and, and just trying to find the next page, the one thing I want to mention too is, is that, okay, that illustration that he showed you, 
that is without banking at all. I mean, that's the raw version of the illustration. That illustration would be like if he bought that illustration or, or, or again, that policy and he put it up on the shelf and he never used it. Those are the numbers. If he's using that money for, okay, the things he's buying in life anyway, or for his investments, then those numbers get bigger because he's playing honest banker with himself because he's going to treat his money the same way he would treat a bank's money. So if he's going to borrow from a bank, you're going to pay them back with interest. But now all he's doing is he's keeping it inside his family and it's a closed system. There's no money being leaked out. So those numbers get bigger. And this is where I say in that book, Becoming Your Own Banker, page 54, 59, 60, 61, and 62, OK, so that illustration is really an example of page 54, which means he just bought the policy and he does nothing with it. As he buys more stuff, the numbers on OK continue to go up. All right. So the death benefit goes up, the cash value goes up and the loan availability goes up. So it can only get better when you use the policy. Correct. Yep. So, again, to Brent's point, these are just the illustrations. This is just the life insurance part. What you do with the policy is what dictates how powerful it is. I, I alluded to it earlier. If you just put your money in a policy, it's a load a lot better than just putting it in the bank. So much better, right? It's going to grow way faster. It's going to be tax-free growth, uh, gives you a, a death benefit. So if you pass away, your family's taken care of way better than putting your money in the bank. However, how you use the policy dictates really how much you can grow money, okay? What I've done over the last year is I started with one policy for 6,000 bucks. I now sit on eight policies. I think we're like around 500,000 a year going in or something like that. And all I do is I just take the money and go do investments with it. And when you really understand these policies, all you're doing is you're just leveraging other people's money. Anyone who who knows about real estate knows that other people's money makes real estate powerful. You can borrow the bank's money to do real estate. You can borrow hard money lenders money to do real estate. You can borrow private money lenders to do real estate. It's all you're doing in a policy. Your money's the collateral. You're borrowing the insurance company's money. All you do is you pay them 5% interest. I have a recent real estate deal that I did using one of these policies where the total to do the deal was $117,000. That included renovation and included payments to the hard money lender. If I were just to pay all that money out of my pocket, I made $70,000. That's a pretty good return, right? 70 grand for spending 117. All I did different is I took what it cost, the 117, borrowed that, so other people's money, from private lenders. And I paid them 15%. So now I'm only in the deal for 8,000 bucks over six months. I didn't stop there though. I used the power of the policies. So I borrowed the 8,000 bucks from the policy to pay the private lenders. So again, guys, you can get really in depth with this stuff and really multiply money. And this is one example. So I borrowed the 8,000 from the policy to pay the money that I borrowed to the private money lenders. And now all I'm doing is I'm paying 5% interest on 8,000 bucks borrowed from my policy. If you guys do the math over a six month period, it was only like 219 bucks. That's literally the only money I have in the deal to go make 70,000. So that's the power of the policy. You can spend 117 to make 70, or you can spend 219 to make 70. That's the power is using the policy to multiply money by simply just borrowing money. That's all you're doing. You're acting like the bank. The bank, you put money in the bank, your deposits. What do they do? They take that money and they lend it to somebody else. They lend it on a car. The person that bought the car pays the bank back with interest. Money comes back. What do they do? They lend it out again. They're just using other people's money, your deposits to make more money. That's all you're doing with the policy. If you do it correctly, you can explode basically your, your money, the growth of it, the velocity of it. So not to get too much in the weeds on that, guys, but that's one example of how I've used it. 
Let's look at an IUL real quick. This is one of my IULs. So this is $12,000 a year that I can put in. So $12,000 a year, the account value, if the market you know, does what it's supposed to do, grows by this much. So I get a little bit of a growth, but because of the surrender value, I don't have any access to it. I can't use any of it, okay? Same thing with the next year. It grows, but I can't use it. I can finally use it in year four. This policy, 12,000, I can use 7,200 bucks. That's based off guarantees. And um, Brent alluded to this. In these IULs, based off guarantees, you can get down to zero. So if we scroll down on this, look at this. At, what would this be, year 47, 48. I could potentially have zero money in this guaranteed. Now, it's probably not going to happen because the market is not going to stay low forever. It goes up, it goes down. So you've got um, non-guaranteed, which could be very high, but it all goes back to the um, actual growth versus the average growth. If it's average, these are based off average numbers. So it's probably not going to mirror this. That's the difference, guys, is this should be used. If you get an IUL, in my honest opinion, this is just my opinion, it should be used for a retirement vehicle. It should not be used for infinite banking because as you can see, the guaranteed values can get to zero. So if you're using your money and you've taken all the cash value out and you've got no cash value and you have to put money into the policy the next year and you've got none to put in, your SOL in a life insurance policy you can actually use your cash value to pay your next policy premium. And it's guaranteed to keep going up. It all goes back to the guarantees. Whole life has a ton of guarantees. IULs don't. IULs don't have guarantees in their fees, their costs. Um, so the insurance company, if they're not as profitable, what can they do? They can go in and totally jack your fees up. So you can pay more for everything within that policy, internal fees, fees to pay their employees because there's no guarantees on it. Whole life is not like that. 100% fees, costs stay exactly the same. So you just get more and more efficient guaranteed for the rest of your life. So I go off on tangents, guys, but I hope yeah. you're getting some value. No, from man. This. No, so good stuff. I'm sitting here taking notes as you're going through it. And that was really good. A couple things I just want to hit on what Devin said. You know, he says IULs. If you're going to buy one, it should be used for retirement. I just disagree with that, but that's fine. It doesn't make him wrong or me wrong or right. We just look at that a little different. See, all right, like if you go back to those pages, and I don't want to keep bringing the same pages up, but I'm telling you that book, Becoming Your Own Banker, it has such powerful information on it. Okay, go back to page 54, 59, 60, 61, 62. And if you notice, okay, all of those numbers, it starts um, with the same Okay, all of those pages, it's, it's okay, so the exact, uh, it's the exact same person. As a matter of fact, he starts at age 30, he retires at age 65, and he dies at age 85. And if you look at retirement age, which is how Nelson wrote it in the book on page 65, he's actually using that whole life policy for retirement income. Well, the more that he's used the policy throughout the life of the policy to buy the stuff, to make the investments that you're going to buy anyway, the retirement income goes up. So how much retirement income are you wanting? Well, it's totally up to you. It depends on how much you're going to put in the policy and how you're going to use the policy. The, the key point is how you're going to use the policy. So I do want you to go back and review those pages because I'm going to be using my retirement income for is going to come out of my whole life policies. I will use that. But again, I'm not going to retire. I don't believe in the word retirement. As a matter of fact, if you read the Bible, is the word retirement even in the Bible? No, you won't find it anywhere, right? So um, I'm, I mean, I'm just not a big fan of retirement. All right. To me, all right. The thing is when you retire, you stop serving other people. You stop serving God's children. That's just my opinion. And if you do what you love, why do you ever want to quit doing it? I mean, how much golf can you play? I mean, how much time can you spend on the couch looking at your spouse every day? You know, I don't, I don't know. I just got to always be going. I asked my wife a couple months ago. I said, Hey, honey, I said, um, 
I said, I don't know, you think we should be doing something different? Should we, right? And she said, well, what are you going to do different? You know, what are you going to do? You'll go absolutely crazy not doing something. So you do what you love. So continue to do it. I said, okay, I'm going to continue to do what I love. And then I, I and again, I was going to do that any way. I just wanted to see what she said. <laughs> it but, depends on how attractive your wife is. Like I could sit <laughs> on the couch, and just watch my wife all day. She's, she's a smoke show. <laughs> That's that, all right. There you go. Nope. I'm, hey, nope. Very good. Um, <laughs> But okay, but two, the thing that Devin said, um, and, and again, the one thing I don't think he hit on, which is really important, if, if okay, so on that policy, all right, um, the thing he did is, is 125,000 of premium he put in the policy. He borrowed out, what was it, 115 or whatever, let's just call it 100 grand. He put in 125 and he borrowed out 100. Well, remember that 125 did not leave your account. It didn't leave your account. So it's growing, as Devin told you earlier, it's continuing to grow that uninterrupted compound interest, even though that you're using the money. So it's continuing to grow, even though you're using it. I don't know of another vehicle or a product on this planet that has these features and benefits that works this way. And if there's something out there that's different and better than what this is, let me know what it is, please. Because I've been looking for about 15 years of what it is. So uninterrupted compound interest. Now, if you're not following Mr. Burr on TikTok, he, he does a ton of videos out there. So if, you, if, if this is your first time to the call, or, and again, I know that the, the thing is he doesn't get on these Wealth Wednesday webinars a lot, but go follow Devin Burr on TikTok. Watch, I mean... Man, I don't know how many things he has out there. You could spend hours watching videos. Go follow Chris Noggle. Go watch what Chris Noggle is doing. Google Chris Noggle, YouTube Chris Noggle. Look at all the different plan designs, the case study, the success stories, the testimonials. All right, again, all right, so the more you get around the campfire and drink the Kool-Aid, the better this stuff gets, man, because you just learn more and more and more. And sometimes you got to watch it over and over and over again, because if you just watch it one time, it doesn't sink in. Because all this stuff that we talk about is not normal thinking. It's not what your parents are doing. It's not what your grandparents are doing, your friends, your colleagues, and your coworkers. It's outside of the box thinking. This isn't what you're being taught about money in the conventional world. So when you look at it, you're like, man, that looks a little weird and it looks a little strange. Why haven't I heard about this before? Why isn't what other people doing it, right? Well, if you think about it, the people that are wealthy, the people that are rich, the people that have money, how many really wealthy people do you know that are sitting down and talking to you about how they're building their wealth? Not a lot probably. So these concepts that we're teaching you, as Devin said, it's not on trial. It's not on, right? So it's not being tested. It's not like we're going to see, well, let's try this and see how it works. No, man. The Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, the Morgans, the Stanleys, the Barclays, it's been around for 200 years. How did Walt Disney build Disneyland? How did Ray Kroc fund McDonald's? How did Pampered Chef get started before Warren Buffett bought it? These concepts have been tried and, trust, tried and tested. It's not like we're going to try it to see how it works. This is what the wealthy do. And as all you guys probably know, conventional banks are the number one purchasers of whole life policies in the world. Go look it up. BOLI, B-O-L-I, Bank Owned Life Insurance. And since 2013, they have quadrupled the amount of policies they purchased. Now, why are they doing that? Is it because they're stupid or they know something the rest of us don't know? So, again, I just wanted to kind of throw that out there because I know there's a lot that is coming at you right now. But go follow Mr. Burr on TikTok. Uh, go follow Chris Noggle. Go look at the YouTube, the Googles, you know, plug that stuff in and just watch stuff take a bit a day or go to the wealth wednesday webinars in the archives chris and i have done a lot together chris has done some on his own i mean over the time and there's so much stuff out there because me personally and i have to eat okay so anyway all right every day i eat live and breathe this stuff i eat live and breathe this but anytime just before i do a live mastermind event which is usually a two or three day event that we do at least once a year i go back and I read stuff that I haven't read in a while. 
And I'm amazed at every time of how much stuff that I've kind of let fall in through the cracks because I've just forgotten it. I'm like, crap, I'm not doing that. That's powerful. Why am I not doing that anymore? How did I get away from that? And so that's why I do these mastermind events every year is because, it, it, yes, it's for you, but really it's for me. It's for me because it makes me, it makes me go back in the books and refresh and recharge and see all the stuff that I haven't been talking about lately because for some reason it's kind of slipped through the cracks because there's a lot of information, but don't get overwhelmed with the information. Just do a little bit at a time. I always say, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, right? Eat it one bite at a time. All right. I get off on tangents too, Devin. Such, so I don't know if such, it's such good points to anymore together. Such good <laughs> points, man. I mean, um, the, the main one that you touched on, I think is huge. And I, I just kind of use my personal experience from this is when I learned about this stuff, um, it was just so far, like left field of what I knew. I'm like, that doesn't sound right, but it does. Like it, it makes sense. But like, how come I haven't heard about this? It makes so much sense, but why isn't it being talked about? It makes so much sense, but why doesn't my family know about it? Why, when I bring it up, they look at me like deer in headlights. Yeah. So it's something where it's not taught. So the best information, what I've found in my life is it's not taught. It's information you have to seek. You have to seek the information. And once you find it, then you have to engulf yourself in it. Once I learned about this, I literally got obsessed, obsessed. I was reading books. I was on, I do the stairs every morning, the Stairmaster mm. um, to try to stay in shape. And what I would do is I would pull up YouTube and just infinite banking concept, how to use it. What is it? And just watch video after video after video. I'd be an hour and a half on the stairs drenched in sweat. And I'm like, this is amazing. How do I learn more? And then I started talking to Chris. Then I started getting on watching these wealth webinars. I started telling other people about it. And just the more you learn, the easier it becomes. It's like anything. Like think about if you play a sport, right? The first time you learn that sport, you're probably super uncoordinated. You're horrible at it. Um, you don't know what to do. You're making a fool of yourself. But then the more you learn it, the more you do it, the better you get. Like I used to, I snowboard, right? When I first started snowboarding, no joke, I couldn't stand up for three feet. I would fall on my butt every three feet on a bunny hill. And I was getting so frustrated. And then I learned how to stay above the board. As soon as I did that, I was hauling butt down the, the mountain. And it was so much fun. The more I do it, the better I get. It's just like this, guys. You have to immerse yourself in the information Keep learning, keep reading books, keep watching YouTube, uh, reach out to me, watch my videos on, on TikTok, watch our videos on YouTube. The more you learn, it's going to make sense and it's just going to click and you'll know what to do. And once you know what to do, it's like my point before, I know for a fact, I can take 117 grand and make a heck of a lot more than 10,000 bucks. I can double, triple, quadruple that money because I know what to do. When you know what to do, you'll do it. Um, so I loved that point. I just wanted to add to it. And then one of the questions I got in here, I really want to make sure I answer it because it might've been a little confusing on when I was talking about how I made that really big return. Um, someone asked, why not just use the 8,000 from the policy directly without getting the hard money lenders? So you could just do that. But what you have to understand is cash on cash returns. If I have $100,000 in a deal and I make 50 grand, I made a 50% cash on cash return. If all I have is $100,000, I'm limited to that one deal. If I have $100,000 and I only have 20 grand in a deal, now I can potentially go do five more at the exact same time and make more money. So that's why I use the policies the way I do. I want the least amount of cash in a deal as possible. So on that deal, I bought the property for 380,000, I think. Renovation and hard money costs were 117. So if I didn't do the hard money, if I just bought it with my policy, 380 grand, plus did the renovation of 94, now I've got, what would that be? Uh, 500 and something thousand dollars from my policy in that one deal. 
now I'm limited. I don't have as much cash value to use, right? So if you leverage other people's money first and then use your policy, your cash on cash return goes through the roof because you can just do far more deals. It's about uh, multiplying it and just getting more out there. So hopefully that answers that question. I wanted to make sure I cleared that up for you guys. Yeah, no good stuff. And I know we're kind of getting down to the end, man, time flies. I know we got nine minutes or so on here. So, so how about if we, because again, we can go on forever. So how about if we go through some other questions? I think you see the questions on your end. Do you want to read a couple? Yeah. So why does taking a loan help it grow more? The interest yeah. goes to the insurance company, not my compounding cash value, correct? Yeah. Well, the thing you're doing is you're taking a loan from the general fund of the insurance company. But when you pay back the loan with interest, as you'll see again on those pages I was telling you about in, in the book. So the additional money that goes back, it, it okay, the thing that does is it buys additional paid up additions insurance. So when it buys additional paid up additions insurance, your loan availability, your cash value and your death benefit increase. And I think you'll see that. And I think we probably have some stuff out there, videos on that. But again, if you go look at those pages in the Nelson book, all right, the ones in the 50s that I told you about, you'll see exactly how that works. But the short answer is, is because when you pay back extra money into the policy, you're buying more additional paid up additions insurance, and it increases that number. Correct. And to add to it, uh, I always go back to a real easy number, 100 grand borrowed, I lend it to my company at 15%. So I have $15,000 more going into my policy every year. I'll never get to the point where I mech the policy because as the money goes back in, I use it again. I do another loan to my business, yeah. pay more back in. So I think right now, I think policy loans, actually, I can tell you, I have all the checks written. So I've got right now one, two, three, four, five policy loans, money just going back into my policy, continuing to just keep going back. I'm not paying back the principal. So that's how you actually get more. And at the end of the year, you just pay the 5% to the insurance company. That doesn't go to you. It goes to the insurance company, but you can write it off as a tax deduction. Let's see, what else do we got? We got, uh, will MEC limits be raised for existing policies after the first of the year? Yeah, so let's talk about the MEC limits. They, okay, so that limit is always changing. It constantly changes on your policy. All of you people that have existing policies, that number is always a moving target. The best way to find out what your policy will hold is call your mapping specialist and say, hey, how much money can I get in my policy today without mecking it? And then they'll find that information for you. Or if you want to call the insurance company directly, you can do that also. But I say call our mapping uh, team because that's what we're here to do is to help and serve you. But that number always changes. And if you get to that point, the thing that'll happen is, is now you've got all this money. So, so the question would be is, well, you got this extra money. The thing you should be doing is starting another policy. And that's why people start additional policies is because they get to a point where they can only get so much into one because you can't overfill it. You can never get 12 ounces of water in a 10 ounce glass. So all the time that changes. But I think your main question was, is, is the MEC ceiling going to raise on the new policy starting January 2022? Yes, that is going to raise, but it's not going to change your existing policies. Nothing changes with your existing policies, right? Everything stays the same, all right? So for example, um, for example, if you are taking a policy loan out at 5% on an existing policy, the brand new one may be 4.5%. So, okay, so yeah, all the policies you already have in force before that change happens, it just goes on like it's normally going on. The new policies are the ones that are being changed. It will not affect your old policies at all. Uh, my first year anniversary was last week for my policy. I don't know if I can put in, uh, more all at once. I'm making monthly deposits. Now that's the beauty of these policies, guys. You have full control over the mode. It's called the premium mode. How often you put money in, you can do monthly, quarterly, 
twice a year or annually. I personally do annually every single time I figure out a way to do it because that gets you the most growth. Cause you figure if you put in 12 grand a year, you're getting $12,000 compounding from day one. If you put in a thousand dollars a month, same amount for the year, but the first month you're only getting a thousand bucks compounding next month, 2000, next month, 3000. Mm -hmm. So if you dump it all in, you get the most growth. That's what I do, but you don't have to, you can switch it back and forth anytime, no penalty. That's the beauty of it. So that was Jennifer Marks. Yeah. No so the mode there. can always change. And also if you ever had to lower your premium amount, the thing that, the, all right, that's another thing where you have flexibility. Like for example, let's say you go through a financial catastrophe or disaster. Now, like if that happens, it's usually going to be in year one and year two. Once you get these policies to the third year and beyond, you're never, ever, ever going to want to stop paying the premium on the policy because the growth gets so huge. So as a matter of fact, it's quite the opposite. What you're wanting to start additional policies, you want to get more and more money into those. But I will tell you back on the policy that I started, my first policy, February of 2008, I started it with $2,000 a month because I didn't have 24,000 to put in in one lump sum. All right. So it doesn't matter where you start. If you can start it annually, then go ahead and do it that way because now you get all the money in immediately and you have the borrowing power of all the of of okay, all the dollars you put in. If you pay it monthly, it's one twelfth at a time, just like Devin said. So really by paying it annually, it kind of in a sense it jump starts the policy by one year. Yeah, definitely. Try to get the money in there. If you can't, you can switch it up. The cool thing is that I love about them is there is flexibility. Like let's say you set your ceiling at 10 grand a year. You should try to put in 12 or $10,000 a year every single year to get the most Absolutely. growth. Always. But we all know life happens, right? Let's say I start a policy for 10 grand. This year I put in 10 grand. Next year, I don't have the money to put in 10 grand. You don't have to. All you have to do is put in the base premium plus your riders. So it, it tends to be about 40%. So if 10 grand is your ceiling, you just have to put in four, <laughs> give or take, to keep the policy alive. You should do that for sure. Do not let your policy lapse. And then you can catch up later. So if you fall behind a couple of years, let's say you fall behind 12 grand because you didn't put in the max, you only put in the four grand for two years. So now you're behind by 12,000 bucks. The next year you have a windfall of cash, you get promoted at work, you do an investment, whatever. You can catch it up later on and get that money compounding anytime. Just don't go over your accumulated total. If you do that, then you run the risk of the policy mecking. But as long as you stay at that accumulated total, you're tax-free for the rest of your life, use and growth. Yeah, just a couple of things I wanna point on that. So, okay, so the base premium, is all you ever need to put into the policy. The paid up additions rider is always optional, right? You can always have an option of whether you want to pay that. But just like Devin said, yes, pay the premium that you're supposed to pay. As far as the mecking thing, so like don't freak out that your policy is going to mech because if your policy is going to mech, it's not going to mech just all by itself and nobody's going to tell you. They're going to be like sending you letters in the mail that says, hey, you tried to overfill this policy. Are you really sure you want it to be a mech? They will contact you. So don't worry about that. I've gotten those letters before. So the insurance company knows that you don't really want to mech the policy. And if you do, they're going to make you tell them and they're going to communicate with you um, okay about that. So uh, again, all right. So don't get way concerned about that, but just pay attention. And the thing I always do is I just say about every three months, just spend about 10 or 15 minutes on your policy or policies and see where it's at, you know, just like what you would do. I mean, right. So like every time you check the oil in your car, maybe, okay, I checked the oil in my car. I'm going to go now check my policy. So if there's some kind of system that you have, just so time doesn't get away from you. And, and then that's why you should be talking to your mapping specialist at least twice a year, because right, that will, okay, that's going to force you to see what's going on in the policy. Believe me, 
I have to pay those mapping specialists to talk to you. So, so right. So like the less you talk to them, the less I have to pay out, but I want you to do it because I want you to see the power of what's going on. Now you're probably thinking, well, Brent, why in the hell would you pay the mapping specialist to do that? Because the thing is, is now that you see the power of it, guess what you're going to do? You're going to tell other people about how powerful your policy works. You're going to buy more policies yourself, refer your friends, colleagues, and coworkers. So it's a win for you and it's a win for us. It's it, it, Again, it's all about win-win relationships. So that's no, it why. Makes a, it makes a ton of sense because I think back to myself, like I learned about this last year, right? So I learned about it and started telling everyone grew a following on TikTok. Now everyone's like, I want to use one of those policies. All I was doing was telling people on TikTok how I use policies. I wasn't an agent. I wasn't getting paid to set up policies. I just did my real estate and used the policies. And people were like, how do I get one? So I was sending business to Chris who set my policy up. I started thinking like, wait a minute, I'm sending a lot of business over. Let's partner up on this, right? So just from me learning it and using it, I think now what have I, I've wrote Brent like 300 something policies since March. Oh, so it's like, yeah, uh, the more people know about like it, like an unbelievable people, amount. It's, it's crazy. The more people know about it, the more people you can help. And I always go back to this with anything you do, the more people you help and serve, the more money you make. The problem is most people think, how do I make more money? How do I make more money? How do I make more money? It's selfish. Think, how can I serve more people? How can I help more people? The money then follows, okay? Think about Jeff Bezos. People had a problem with going to shop for stuff, right? They didn't want to go to the retail stores. So Jeff Bezos solved their problem by making everything delivered to your door the next day. Now think about it. He is a multi, 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 multi billionaire because he helped so many people solve their problem. That's all we do, guys, is we help people solve their financial problems exactly. by, using, by using this vehicle. And from that, we make a lot of money, but we help a lot of people. That's what it's about. Uh, absolutely. And again, it, all right, the quote I always like to, to, to quote is what the late Zig Ziglar said. And Zig Ziglar said, if you help enough other people get what they want, you end up getting what you want. And, you know, that's what we're here to do. We're here to serve you. And it's a win-win for everybody. So, um, no, good deal. All right. Any last minute things? I know we got to wrap it up, Devin, or, or, or right. At least I do, but, um, any last minute questions? Uh, let's see. I don't see any questions. It's more just statements. It looks like, um, so I guess I'll just leave it like this and then you can leave it with whatever you want. Brent is, um, this stuff is not again, taught. It's not something that it's widely known. Um, and you probably see me and Brent talking this about this on the screen. You're like, this stuff sounds crazy. Like, how could I possibly do that? I need you to understand. I did not know about this until the pandemic last year. I first heard about it in March of 2020. So March of 2020, I heard about it. I studied it. I engulfed myself and I learned as much as I could. And then I got on a phone with Chris, I think like end of April. I got my first policy funded. I think it was beginning of June. So June of 2020 was my first policy. I now again have eight policies. I use them every day. I help people actually learn this and get them policies. I help them actually make more money by strategizing the way I do it. That all happened in a year, basically. So don't sit there and feel like this is too crazy. I could never do what they're doing. You basically just have to, again, engulf yourself in the information, learn it, and then teach other people. If you teach someone else something, you get very good at the fundamentals, okay? If you talk to any basketball coach, football coach, soccer coach, they're extremely good at the fundamentals because they teach it. Yeah. Same thing. So engulf yourself, learn it. Don't feel like it's over your head. And eventually, who knows, you might be on our team talking on one of these wealth webinars. And, and then, yeah, guys, if there's any other information you want to reach out, you can reach out to me, to Gabby, to Steven, to Chris, to Devin, you know, Hannah, you know, all of us are here to serve you. I think you have our contact information. If not, you know, um, it's in the chat box somewhere, probably, right? Our emails um, and our, 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 our texting numbers and things like that. So, um, 
Um, but yeah, so, and, and then two, just to kind of go on what Devin said, I mean, so like Chris isn't on the call today, but that's how Devin came a part of our team was through Chris. And Chris will tell you, Devin was a pain in the ass in the beginning. I mean, he was, he, he, he was very skeptical, very hesitant. And as a matter of fact, when he started his first policy, and I'm not going to go through the story, but Chris will tell you sometime, he wanted to start this tiny little bit policy because he's like, no, 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 it doesn't work that way. I got to see how it works. And Devin, he was kind of a pain to Chris, right? Well, me personally, too, I was kind of like Devin. It took me two years to get started. I first heard it in 2006, and I didn't get started until 2008. So like Devin went way quicker than I did, but I waited two years. And I know I kick myself in the rear end every day that I waited because that time just goes by because you got to remember the policy is most efficient tomorrow. Tomorrow is going to be way more efficient today in the policy than today. Every day makes that policy be more and more efficient. So time, the longer that policy is enforced, the more efficient that it becomes. So it's all going to work exactly like the way we show you. And it's all right. If you like that video, make sure you check out this video right now. And also don't forget, subscribe to my channel and don't ever forget to smash that alert button. We'll see you on the next one.